we are celebrating the publication of this Aww. book. We're also honoring the publication of Greg Petmore's book, which I don't have to show yeah. you. Uh, and there it is. If you're interested in buying this book, you can, you can make an appointment. You can um, email manager at berkeleyhistoricalsociety.org and um, suggest some times when you would be willing to come down to the center to pick it up. Or for an additional $8, he can mail it to you first class. Um, let me see. Oh, the price is $18, in including tax for members and $20 for non-members. R.V. Smith, take it away. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so we're gonna start off with a little brief introductions of, of the two books. The uh, first one uh, will be introduced by uh, Therese Pipe, who is an active oral history volunteer at Berkeley Historical Society. And um, the, uh, this is the Bob Marsh book. And um, Berkeley Historical Society has been involved in documenting the co-op for 27 years uh, with 20 oral histories culminating in the Bob Marsh book and uh, an exhibit in series of programs that were held in 2011. Um, after Therese, then Bob, uh, Chuck Wollenberg is, uh, who was a board member of Berkeley Historical Society and author of Berkeley, A City in History uh, we'll introduce uh, Greg Patmore's book and um, give a, a sense also of his, uh, his you know, uh, background and experience with the co-op. So, Therese, take it away. Okay, I'll do, what I, I'll do my best. I'll be looking down my notes, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, um, well, it's really exciting. I mean, I'm just getting used to Zoom. I have to tell you, I'm really new at it. So I'm not sure how this is going to go. And um, this is the first time I'm really communicating verbally on, on Zoom uh, without with the visual, because usually I did it on the phone before, but now I have a webcam. OK, so I hope you'll bear with me. OK. Uh, <clears throat> you look very good. Pardon me? What was that? You look good. Oh, thank you. You look thank fine. You. <laughs> Well, at least I got to get to, to get my hair on top. <laughs> <laughs> that was an effort. <laughs> okay, I want to start out by telling you that um, we've been working on the book for about three years, um, and uh, fundamentally to, to to you know to be able to get it into publication form, and uh, it's been you know really exciting to 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 have it in 2020. I was sort of hoping we'd publish it in 2020. So it's exciting to do that. And it's also been a good diversion for the for the virus thing going on. Mm -hmm. I know Anne wanted me to go into the history of how this all started. And it has to do actually with, with a professor from Maine who used to come over here in the summertime. His name was Herb Maccabee. And he started interviewing people about the co-op. This is back in the um, in the 1980s, and it might even have been as early as 1970s. But anyway, we had that's why we published three of the ones he did earlier, and one of them was uh, Ahonen and um, and Jean Manila, and then uh, Nolenberger was the third one, and then I interviewed um, Margaret Gordon in the early 80s. So that got the thing go, uh, continuing in that regard. And, uh, and, and you know, it was very exciting doing it. And I had no idea it would, it would go on until today, which is quite amazing. Oh, dear, there's someone at the door, but I'm going to have to let them <clears throat> not worry about me. Okay. Um, so at any rate, it goes way back. And, uh, and as I say, Margaret Gordon, and then what we tried to do was, in, I was criticized at one point uh, for not uh, interviewing uh, the, uh, the progressives. And I was leaning more toward the moderates. And therefore I was told, you know, that I needed to include them. So that's where Bob Truhaff came up. And that was, um, let's see, the date for Bob Truhaff. 
that was 1990 when we published it and um and it was it was uh, oh dear i'm gonna have to they're knocking on the door uh, can you just give me a minute Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello. We can go back I see a lot of people i haven't seen you for ages oh gosh it's been a while we moved uh, to berkeley in 46 so uh we were definitely involved What's your name? Anne Hallett. Oh, okay. <laughs> Does anybody uh, know their co-op number? Sure. Yeah. 20120. 15221. 1627. 23568. 1627. 92957. Wow. That's a high one. <laughs> so it sounds they like they recycled them, so it doesn't always mean when you joined. That's right. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Carol Pearson, you're there. It's Vanji. Nice to see you. So going back to Robert Truha, uh, at that point in time, that was in 1990, 19, yeah, 1990, this when it was published. And the thing is, in 1987, because we had the 50th anniversary of the co-op then, although it was already declining in certain ways, um, we were able to get some funding from a woman named Lynn White, who donated money in um, in honor of her her husband's memory. He had passed away rather prematurely, Clinton White. So we had this funding. So actually, I hired somebody to do the interview with um, with Robert Truhaff, a very fine oral historian, and he even did the index to a fellow named um, Bob Larson. Okay, and then during the 1987, um, let's see, and then the Bob March, let's see, oh, the, the Bob March interview came up. Well, around that time, that was around the time I interviewed Bob March, too, because there were, you know, opportunities to do it during that period, although we didn't publish anything right away. And then I wanted also to, to tell you that, um, uh, that Professor Patmore's decision uh, to, to, for his research on the Berkeley Co-op, because he was coming out to Berkeley quite frequently, starting, I think, about maybe about 2010. I'm not really positive, but it came across right. some correspondence about, uh, about our, him coming. He decided to transcribe five oral histories that had to do, that were of interest to him. He wanted to you know, see them in written form. And therefore, uh, the Bob March was one of them. And that's how we came in, we decided to go ahead and publish that one as a more formal oral history. And we went ahead and, and did it in detail. So we have him to thank for that, for that opportunity. And let's see. Um, so that uh, summer 2011. Oh, then in 2011, uh, we had our big uh, co-op uh, exhibit here at, at the History Center. And uh, Linda Rosen and I were the two curators at the time. And she actually made some comments and I'd like to share them with you. Let me see if I can find them here. Yeah, she, um, she I was just in touch with her the last two days. She says the Berkeley co-op pioneered consumer education and protection, ingredient labeling and unit pricing, and influence Berkeley politics, all in, all in one bundle. And, uh, and she was delighted to be part of the, you know, our, our exhibit planning and all that. And her husband, Stephen, did all the work on about 50 photographs that he upgraded, and they were all on the wall uh, in the history center. And we still have, uh, I believe we have most of that still in the archives, which is sort of exciting that we can look back on. And then she also said, um, uh, the positive spirit, uh, she also said the exhibit explain, explored the po positive spirit that built the most successful co-op uh, supermarket in the nation. And, uh, and it was called Consumers Cooperative of Berkeley, a noble experience a noble venture. So anyway, we were thrilled to do that. And she did give Bob Shildon um, a few interesting comments, you know, because he had really, he had really pulled together, a lot, 
being that he had historical information on the co-op, having been the, the editor in the 80s of the co-op news, he talked to a um, helped us by putting panels together about the early period of the co-op and how, you know, on, in, in looking at it. And then also he had certain knowledge of how the demise occurred. And so he was able to contribute to that as well. And therefore I'm gonna jump fast forward to the Bob Barch book because in the Bob Barch book, uh, Bob Shilgren was asked to write the final chapter and, um, and look up the, the different co-op news articles that talked about Bob March's involvement in trying to save the co-op after it went down in 1988, which he did for about five years, but unfortunately it's, it still failed. So at any rate, um, so those are, those are basic comments. And then I wanted to talk about a few of the, um, a few of the, oh, and, and also I, I, I feel very uh, honored that we had it published this year because it's the same year that Pat Moore published his book, his definitive story about the Berkeley Co-op. And I, I felt very honored. So there, there's certain ones I wanted to refer to, certain oral histories. As I say, Margaret Gordon was the early one in 1984. Her husband had been very active with the co-op. His name was Aaron Gordon. And he was in the, he was the head of the economics department at Berkeley. And uh, she also worked on the campus. So Robert Truhav was 1990. And then in 1995, we had Yasukoshi. And that was, um, let's see, that was George Yasukoshi who had been the controller for over 20, 25 years. And he was, in, he had a previous interview that, that he had in his possession. And therefore that's the one we transcribed. And, uh, and uh, he kept very close touch with us for the rest of his life, actually, because he was very devoted. He was a very devoted member of the co-op. And uh, his daughter was actually on the exhibit committee, Valerie, and I'm still in touch with her. I just wrote to her uh, recently. And then in um, 1996, there were two, there were two that were published. Um, Betsy Wood, who was interviewed earlier, and Bob Neptune, uh, who was the very first, he was actually the first employee of the, of the Berkeley Co-op before it merged with the Finnish group. And uh, anyway, he, he was with the Co-op for at least 46 years. But I think Bob March exceeded the timing. He, his, his devotion or his commitment was a bit longer. And then Betsy Wood was the only home economist we had interviewed. And she was, the two of them, both Neptune and Betsy Wood were, um, were published in 1996. And then there's a, another fast forward here because, um, because we did, we, we just recently published the Bob Arnold. And, and so it, in a way, all those years have gone by, but, you know, but it still feels kind of fresh in my mind and you know my co-op history I mean my memories of the co-op and all that and all the people that I connected with and Linda Rosen actually Linda Rosen and I kind of shared uh, being in charge of oral history over the <clears throat> over a certain period of time so we alternated in being in charge of various oral histories that came along and one of them was for Zach Brown who was very active with the co-op credit union as well as being on the city council. And he was very highly regarded. So at any rate, um, I think that's all I have to say. And uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Okay, next will be uh, Chuck Wallenberg talking about Greg's book. Okay, I'll try to brief. Um, the book is entitled Innovative Consumer Cooperatives, The Rise and Fall of Berkeley. And here it is. I feel a little strange introducing the book when the author is just uh, two, two squares over for me. <laughs> but um, uh, Greg Patmore is uh, emeritus professor at uh, University of Sydney in Australia. 
I think it's fair to say that in addition to being a scholar of the cooperative movement, he's also very much a supporter of that movement. And as Therese said, he did spend quite a bit of time here in Berkeley. He interviewed um, former employees of the co-op, former activists in the co-op. He also did a lot of um, archival, archival research at the Bancroft Library and at the Berkeley Historical Society. So this is a very well researched book. Um, Pat Moore, I think what he's, one of the things he's trying to do and did succeed in doing was putting the history of the Berkeley Co-op into a broader national and even international perspective of the development of the co-op, the cooperative movement. Um, but the, if you take the chapters that are specifically related to Berkeley, what they, what they really do, what they really are is a very detailed and factual history of the 50 years that the Berkeley Co-op existed from the late 1930s to the late 1980s. And included in that is the incredible rise of the Berkeley Co-op in the post-war period until by the late 70s, uh, it was the largest consumer co-op in the United States. It was the largest retailer in Berkeley. It, um, it had what, over 100,000 members. Uh, it seemed to be a, an institution that would last forever. But then the book also deals with the equally dramatic and devastating decline of the co-op in the 1980s, culminating with the closing of the last three stores here in Berkeley and with the declaration of, um, of uh, bankruptcy. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think a lot of people look for a, a single cause of the decline and fall of the co-op, but I think uh, Professor Patmore has made a very good case that it was a lot of different causes and a lot of different factors, some of which were under the control of the Berkeley co-op, some of which were out of the control of the Berkeley Co-op. Um, Patmore doesn't regard the demise of the Berkeley Co-op as a complete failure of the institution. He talks about a lot of the accomplishments it made in things like education and advocacy for healthy foods and in so many other areas. And not the least of it is the fact that the thing lasted for 50 years, that it stayed in business for 50 years. Um, I think that, um, and, and I think it's also obviously true that cooperative enterprises still exist in Berkeley and thrive in Berkeley, including the, the, um, the cheese board, which is a workers cooperative or the art cooperative ACCI, or of course the student housing cooperative, which I think now has lasted for over 80 years. So the, the failure of the Berkeley Consumer Co-op didn't mean the failure of cooperative enterprises either in Berkeley or for that matter in the nation or the world. I think if you're if you're looking for a book that is going to be a kind of a nostalgic trip back to the good old days of the co-op, this probably isn't your book. This is a serious scholarly factual um, account. I think also if you're looking for a book that's going to expose the villain or the group of villains that caused the failure of the co-op, this also isn't your book. But if you do want a serious, um, scholarly, factual, detailed history of those 50 years of the co-op, I think this, this certainly is your book. And if you want to know a lot more about um, Greg Patmore's ideas about the co-op and about other things, just stay tuned because through the magic of Zoom, we have Greg Patmore here all the way from Australia. Cool. Uh, say the name of the book again. It's Innovative Consumer Cooperatives, The Rise and Fall of Berkeley. And it's published by uh, Rutledge here. I don't know if you can see it, but here's, here's what it looks like. Okay. VHS has two copies for sale. And I think I have one of them. So if, if, if you sell two of them, I've, I've got to get one back to John. As I said, don't spill your breakfast on it. Right. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to launch into our panel. Uh, first, I'll introduce our, our three uh, speakers, and then I'll do a little, a little brief background, uh, provide a little bit of context, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll have them uh, each uh, speak. So first, I'll uh, introduce again uh, Greg Patmore. Um, he's Emeritus Professor of Business and Labor History and Chair of the Business and Labor History Group and the Cooperative Research Group at the, at the University of Sydney. Uh, Greg was president of the Australian Society for the Study of Labor History and editor of its journal, Labor History. He is author of A Global History of Cooperative Business and as, as we know, the new book, Consumer Cooperatives, The Rise and Fall uh, of Berkeley. Bob Shurgeon is uh, author of Hey, Mr. Green, a collection of columns and blogs he wrote for Sierra, the Sierra Club's national magazine, where he was managing editor. He is also author of Toyohiko Kagawa, a Apostle of Love and Social Ju Justice. For seven years, he was co-editor of the Co-op News. His articles have appeared in a wide variety of publications from underground papers to mainstream magazines. His poetry has appeared in many journals. He's a native of Wisconsin, uh, and he's a longtime Berkeley resident where he indulges his green thumb. Michael Fullerton uh, is editor of What Happened to the Berkeley Co-op, a collection of opinions. His first, and, and you can find that online, by the way. His, uh, he first uh, went to work for the co-op in 1974, as he mentioned, as an education assistant at uh, the Telegraph Avenue uh, Co-op Center. He became co-editor of the weekly Co-op News in 1976, a position he held until the co-op closed in 1988. Uh, Bob was his partner there from 1978 until 1984. And uh, later, Michael worked as an editor at UC Berkeley Extension, um, and he's lived in Berkeley continuously since 1968. And just to briefly introduce myself, um, I've curated several exhibits at uh, Berkeley Historical Society, and I'm author of Berkeley and the New Deal. Um, for about a year, uh, from January 85 to 86, I was the member services and marketing director at the co-op. So my experience at the co-op began as a shopper probably in the mid 60s when I first lived in Berkeley. Uh, I neglected to get a co-op number and by the 1970s, like many others in Berkeley, I used the free clinic number 980. Um, eventually as an employee, I signed up and also became a member of the co-op credit union, which I visited this week for uh, International Credit Union Day. Although the grocery stores of the consumers cooperative are gone, there are still other cooperatives in Berkeley, as, as Chuck mentioned. Um, not far from Berkeley can be found also farming cooperatives, utilities uh, cooperatives, insurance cooperatives. And we have uh, a California Center for Cooperative Development and nonprofit organization that was originally launched uh, as a program at UC Davis. So the cooperative movement is still alive and has a long history in the US. Uh, and that's you know, partially detailed by the books we're presenting today, but also by Berkeley resident and a worker co-op member, John Curl in his articles and, and book for all the people uncovering the hidden history of cooperation, cooperative movements and communalism in America. Uh, my own work with New Deal history brought me to Jacob Baker, who led a two and a half month study tour of European <clears throat> cooperatives uh, and submitted to President Roosevelt a 321 page report of the inquiry on cooperative enterprise in Europe, 1937. Oh. So cooperatives were important during the depression. And when the consumers uh, cooperative Berkeley uh, was started during that time. 
Major programs of the New Deal, like the Rural Electrification Administration, depended on cooperatives to accomplish its goals. Cooperative stores were even owned by Japanese American internees when they were forced into concentration camps during World War II. So the cooperative model is relevant today, uh, ever so relevant uh, in our economy of overwhelming corporate greed and power. Cooperatives provide true economic democracy, replacing the narrowly focused profit motive with the human focused service motive. So let's hear what our speakers have to say about our very special co-op. Greg, you're up first. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, um, Harvey. Um, yeah, so, well, thanks for inviting me to be here today. And uh, I'd like to, as I say, uh, thank the Berkeley Historical Society and all those who helped me in the book. And uh, thanks, Chuck, for your comments uh, about the book. Uh, your book was very important for me for putting Berkeley in its social and political context. So it wouldn't have been possible without you in that sense of providing the background. So I thank you for that book very much. Um, what I'm going to talk about briefly, and um, in fact, Harvey just actually touched upon it, is the origins of the uh, Berkeley Society and we'll make some brief references to it. Um, and uh, first, I suppose the most important thing is the context. And again, Harvey um, mentioned that in his comments just, just a few moments ago about the importance of the context of the depression. Um, at a national level, of course, we've got FDR and Harvey mentioned the fact that there was a delegation sent to Europe to look at cooperatives as the third way between uh, communism, socialism and capitalism. And President Roosevelt was also very instrumental in uh, recognising cooperatives in things like the uh, New Deal and also in setting up electricity cooperatives and also um, passing legislation at the federal level that recognised credit unions. At the Californian level, of course, the context of the Depression was um, we also found a rise or I should say by the 1934, there was only about three consumer cooperatives we know of operating in California. Uh, many had, there had been an interest in the uh, First World War and just after the First World War, but there was a collapse in cooperatives in California, largely due to one particular cooperative that we would say in Australia was a little bit dodgy. Um, and uh, we find by 1934, there are about three, the most notable of which was the one at Fort Bragg. Uh, which some of you may have heard about, the cooperative that existed at Fort Bragg. Um, and what really sort of go, goes on in California is, uh, is the, self, the rise of self-help cooperatives in the Depression as a response to the Depression by unemployed people doing labour in exchange for uh, food and services. These cooperatives became a very Californian uh, contribution to helping people during the uh, depression. They were basically, as I say, set up by unemployed workers. And on top of that, of course, you've got Upton Sinclair's 1932 uh, campaign for governor uh, and the concept of EPIC, um, which was an idea of developing self-help uh, in California and trying to take over unoccupied factories and get them working to bring California out of the depression. All these things together, both at state and federal level, were creating an environment or a culture of support for the idea of cooperatives, whether they be consumer cooperatives, um, electrical cooperatives, or whatever. And as I say, I should say that was 1934, the Upton Sinclair campaign. This also was added to, and you probably may be aware, I know some of you are, about the influence of Kagaya, a, a Japanese cooperator who came to the Bay Area uh, to promote uh, cooperatives. He also is a link between my country and yours because he also visited Australia and also visited New Zealand as well as the United States. And there's always been a strong Japanese link between the Berkeley Cooperative and uh, the Japanese Cooperative mm. Movement. And it goes right back to, to that, that trip in the 1930s. Um, I find arising out of EPIC uh, a lot of interest in cooperatives. Um, buying groups uh, were very important uh, in, in the Bay Area. 
Uh, Roy Wilson uh, got involved in buying groups. So this idea of groups of people just getting together and putting together, pooling some money to buy groceries at a cheap price. And of course, what happens is we find in 1937, all this comes together, these buying groups under an umbrella group called Pacific Cooperative Services. PCS uh, was founded in uh, January 1937, and it pushed the idea of setting up autonomous stores uh, throughout uh, the Bay Area. And uh, the one at Berkeley, of course, uh, from what we understand, opened up in 1937, the original, what began the process of the movement towards the Berkeley Co-op. Also, I should point out, we have another important co-op developing around this time, the Berkeley Cooperative Union, which was a Finnish cooperative, uh, ran a, a gas station. And uh, in night, the, gradually the Berkeley Cooperative Unit of the PCS became so successful that it in, desired its own autonomy because it was critical of the slow decision-making of the PCS that in uh, 1939, we find the incorporation of the Berkeley Cooperative. So the origins of the cooperative are very much against the background of an international surge of interest, a national surge of interest and a state surge of interest in cooperatives. Now, I'll say a few brief things about the early days of the cooperatives, of the Berkeley Cooperative. Um, one of the problems, in fact, one of the things when, when you look at the, that early period prior to the merger with the Berkeley Cooperative Union in 1947, was that uh, it had a rocky start, particularly during the Second World War. I know we tend to focus on the period of the 60s, the 70s and beyond, but it had its own teething problems brought on by a number of issues relating to the war. And it's just interesting when you look at that early period to realise there was turbulence in management, particularly after Neptune left. Uh, one uh, manager was sort of... Uh, removed because they weren't seen as strong enough in terms of cooperative principles. We also have interesting experiments in that early period with branch stores in Berkeley, uh, which sort of didn't really work. Part of the reason they were set up was because deliveries costs were rising with the shortages of petrol and the idea was to set up small local stores. So in some ways you can see some problems. There were losses in the early 40, in the 1940s too. The co-op made some losses as well. So this early period was a little bit shaky in some ways and there were some issues there. But at the same time, we see a lot of interesting long-term issues developing. A close, and I know we're gonna talk about this later, but a close relationship to the uh, early union unions. Union, in fact, the um, retail clerks gave a little bit of a holiday to the uh, cooperative in setting up and not requiring it to pay full union rates, for example. And this, of course, began a long-term uh, close relationship with the union and a fairly good one for most of the period. We also see the rise of AC, um, the cooperative wholesaler, which also becomes unravels a bit too as we move in time forward. And of course, the personalities are there. Bob March, um, Bob Neptune, they're all sort of floating around. Uh, Eugene Miller in this early involvement in this very early period as well. And I'll, I'll just leave my comments there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Okay, next up is Bob. Oh, yeah, Can your you turn, me? Bob. Yeah, go ahead, okay. please. All right. Uh, I, I really thought that was a wonderful presentation from Greg, uh, yeah. from Greg Patmore. Thank you very much for staying up that late. <laughs> well, it's actually it's early. Late. It's nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I like to put Bob March in a, in a context of the history of the co-op because when the, when the Rochdale Co-op was formed in 1844, no, 34, uh, they, ha they had one unique rule and that was open membership. Anybody could join, regardless of their politics, their religion or lack of religion uh, or any other, their union membership, any other activities, Bob, he came to the co-op, I think, largely with a religious inspiration, which would 
which was one of the unique things about co-op. I'm, so Bob came in very early as a, really the second employee of the entire co-op, in the, in, along with Bob Neptune, and spent his entire career in the co-op movement. But as, as I was saying, came in from that religious angle, and many people came in from different, different directions into the co-op. He uh, later, he went back to Minnesota for a while to establish a co-op there and really was not terribly successful. He returned to the Bay Area and he ended up actually working for the co-op credit union. That was, that was the last position in his career was with the co-op credit union. So it's a life of complete dedication to the co-op movement in, in both the, the retail and the financial end, end of things. And he was always uh, inspiring to me because he was such a gentle soul and yet very compassionate, very passionately dedicated to the co-op movement. This is why he put up his own money and, and worked for four or five years after the co-op collapsed in 1988, try to reestablish it. Uh, unfortunately, he was not successful in that effort. So uh, I think that that his, his motive was so strong and so interesting that he was able to build an entire career in the co-op and, and actually love discussing everything about the co-op. You, you, could, you could talk to him endlessly about anything relating to the cooperative or the cooperative movement. And I, I found that uh, beautiful in a way uh, because so many people became rather cynical about the organization. So many people drifted away from it or never had the kind of uh, ideological grounding that Bob had. He, he did a, a thesis at Cal about the cooperative movement. Uh, a very interesting piece of writing uh, describing various aspects of the co-op movement. So he was immersed in it in a way that I think too few people have been. And too few people were able to embrace the, the ideology of the co-op. I think if we had followed, if we had done more co-op education and had actually more training in, in, cooperative, in the cooperative movement, I think we may have succeeded and, and been able to live through the, the, the decline, the, what became the declining years in the 1980s. Um, Unfortunately, that did not happen. So that's that's uh, pretty much my take on Bob, and um, I think that I think the uh, the the book is a is a good one, uh, and uh, and I rec highly recommend it for readership. Um, that's about it. Okay. Uh, you still hear me? Yeah. Uh, Michael is up next, and you know Mike has uh, edited a sort of, I guess you could call it a postmortem, but I love the subtitle, a collection of opinions, because there are many different opinions about what happened to the co-op. So uh, go ahead, Mike. Hi there. So I, I think I'll echo that point that was made earlier about the book that I edited. It, it, and it was clearly not just one thing. There were various things uh, going on, one of which was emphasized there by Bob Shilgen that there wasn't enough uh, education about uh, the co-op and, and co-op principles. And then coming around to the Bob March book, uh, I did not know Bob well, but I would see him almost every week because he would bring in the display ads for the co-op credit union. And he was always very charming when he came and very friendly. And then one indication of this was uh, he actually uh, 
tried to fix me up romantically with, I believe it was a relative of his, but I was dating someone else at the time and did not follow through on that. So that's pretty much my memories of, of Bob. But uh, with regard to the co-op, uh, from the beginning, before I went to work there, I was enamored of the co-op, without a doubt. I was very fond of the home economists who had uh, store hours, posted store hours. So they were personally present in the co-op from time to time. And of course, they had their weekly column in the co-op news, which was a very early example of nutrition education. I think they and Jane Brody at that time were the main people writing about this subject. Of course, since then, there have been many, many people writing about it. But that was one of the very nice things about the co-op. Uh, Betsy Wood, she may even be listening today. She was, of course, uh, one of the uh, co-op home economists. And I guess there, from what I heard earlier, there's an oral history of, uh, of, of Betty Wood by the Historical Society. Then, of course, there was the Kitty Corral. And I don't think I knew that Banshee worked there uh, early before I knew her. She worked in the yeah. Kitty Corral, where people could uh, drop off their kids while they shopped. And that was a fairly charming uh, matter. Another element in terms of uh, making the co-op friendly to families was uh, at the check stands, they did not have at the check stands all these impulse items, which your typical grocery store has today. They did not have candy bars and, and other unhealthy sugary snacks that the kid would want and the parent would not want to buy it and would uh, pr produce problems there at the check stand. And it's interesting to note that on that score that very recently, the Berkeley City Council has passed a measure that's going to require stores in Berkeley to not display no. products of this time at this kind, no. of this kind at the check stand. That's and I actually, I actually wrote to two council members about it and they responded very uh, sweetly saying that, uh, yes, they appreciated the co-op being first in this area. And uh, they both remembered their co-op member. That would be uh, Kate Harrison and uh, Sophie Hahn. Uh, then I think the co-op news was pretty well received in the community as a whole. Uh, you know, most people on early in the week, you get only bills. But the co-op news had a lot of news of consumer issues besides the home economist's column. And of course, people used it every week to organize their shopping. And the home economists in there had a list that I think was called Lifeline Foods, where it was a group of foods that differ every week where the prices were reduced somewhat. And they were sort of a very a healthy collection of, of foods for, for that week. Another thing that they, the co-op had, this is again before I even worked there, they had an extensive bulletin board. I worked two years, as someone said, at the Telegraph Avenue Center at Telegraph and Ashby. <laughs> And that bulletin board was sort of an early version of Craigslist. Uh, you know, you could uh, you could sell a car there, you could buy a car there, you could find a uh, a uh, ride share to Los Angeles or some national park there. And I certainly made use of that bulletin board a, a lot uh, myself. Now, I think another thing worth no no noting is uh, I have heard it said that the Shattuck Avenue Center had the uh, highest sales volume of any store west of the Mississippi. So it was a very successful store. And I think it's possible that had somewhat different decisions been made that the co-op would have been able to carry on with just the, uh, the stores in Berkeley. I mean, the success of that store was amazing. It generated a whole, what came to be known as the gourmet ghetto, although that term is not now favorably uh, people aren't inclined to use that term anymore. But I don't think it's any accident that Chez Panisse was located across the street, that Pete's Coffee was located just around the corner, that the cheese board opened up just down the street. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, but, but what is now Saul's Deli just down the street. So uh, <clears throat> various uh, uh, gourmet restaurants uh, uh, and food purveyors uh, opened up there. Uh, right near the co-op because it was uh, such a, a central point in, in, in Berkeley. Um, I think in general about co-ops in general, uh, other people may have made this point, two areas where they've been very successful are credit unions and farm co-ops. Uh, consumer co-ops, at least in the US, 
have not been that successful. And I think part of it is that it's not really an essential portion for people's lives. Like the credit union, that's your money. The farm co-op, that's your business. You really need those things. Um, so, but uh, those other two were very, very successful. And as people have said before, uh, several co-ops are still going strong in Berkeley, including the, the Cheese Board, the Student Housing Co-op, the ACCI Gallery. It used to be the associated, the, the artists and crafts people cooperative incorporated. But I think people thought that was a bit long and wasn't highbrow enough. So they changed it to uh, ACCI. Um, but anyway, there are, and then there's a bicycle co-op there, uh, worker co-op on uh, Shattuck and uh, uh, others as well, other uh, worker co-ops. So uh, I think that might be, uh, that might be all I have to say for, for right now. And I look forward to hearing people's uh, questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for all our panelists. And I'll start off with a question or two and then we'll open it up. We've got over a half hour to, I think, delve into things. So the first one that maybe is the one that is in a way loaded. Um, are there things that you think could have been done differently that would have enabled the co-op to survive? And again, I mean, Mike, you were edited a, a book that had many different opinions. So, but that maybe just briefly, or there are a couple of things that you think would have would have yeah. helped. Well, I think there were uh, one thing that could have happened differently for sure, is there does seem to have been some unwise expansion. I mean, co-ops, food co-ops, yeah. have done best in university communities. The Davis co-op is still going. The Arcada co-op is still going. The, the Puget Sound co-op is still going up in Seattle. Uh, so uh, expanding outside of Berkeley was uh, risky at best. Uh, in particular, the, the purchase of the three Oakland stores as a group, all fairly close together, with mm -hmm. one very close to the Telegraph Avenue Center, seems to have been perhaps uh, unwise. And then the other thing about the expansion was when stores were not doing well, there was a hesitancy to take action and close them, even though they could be losing money. There was always hope that maybe they could be turned around. And that was uh, augmented by the idea that, uh, well, once you've signed up members for a store, you don't wanna let those members down. So you wanna keep their store open and hope for the best. And I think hoping for the best in some cases led to uh, stores uh, being open uh, uh, too long. Uh, so that, that was one big element I think was involved in uh, that could have gone uh, differently uh, and might, because I do, I do believe that the Berkeley stores alone could have uh, succeeded uh, for a long, much longer uh, period of time. But as some people have noted, the very fact that the business lasted for 50 years from the 30s to the uh, to the 80s is amazing in itself because uh, very few businesses do that well. Do some of you feel also that perhaps the fact that the co-op, I mean, it was, a, I think we'd all agree it was a good thing that co-op had a unionized workforce, but I think there was also perhaps a reluctance, you know, to besides uh, cut consumers off from the co-op, uh, cut workers off from their jobs. I know when I was there, there was a whole discussion around the warehouse operation. And it, as the co-op uh, kind of contracted, it seemed like the warehouse operation I heard uh, probably should have been terminated uh, much earlier. So do you think that union aspect had something to do with it also? Looking out for the workers and a reluctance to perhaps lay people off? Yeah, the union situation was complicated. I mean, uh, the, the other food co-ops that I mentioned that have been successful, as far as I know, have house unions, unions that just involve uh, people that work at, at that co-op. But uh, so there's a divided loyalty when you're part of the larger union, the same union representing Safeway and Lucky. So for some union workers, uh, loyalty is not so much to the co-op as to the larger union because they know whatever happens with the co-op, 
they can go right across the street and get a job at Safeway or Lucky or another store, they would have a certain degree of uh, seniority. Um, I think Barbara March uh, uh, Bogue is also with us, and I just wondered either she can say something or if people have questions, I want to point out that Bob Marsh's uh, daughter is, is um, one of the uh, audience members today. So we, well, why don't we open it up uh, if people have comments or questions. Um, Harvey, uh, this is, can you hear me? It's Marty Schiffenbauer. Yes, we can hear you. Go right ahead. Okay. So basically, I uh, my connection with the co-op is I, I came to Berkeley in 60, moved here permanently in 67, immediately <laughs> uh, joined the co-op. I think my co-op number is 15217 or something like that. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, um, I also worked at the co-op um, for about 10 years. I was assistant editor. And also uh, when Mike went on a kind of world tour, uh, I was a co-editor with Bob Shilgen, uh for about six months. Uh, I was uh, assistant editor right through the end. I, I worked on the last copy of the co-op news. And uh, my feeling about, you know, the one big decision at the end, you know, Lynn McDonald came in as general manager and she did close a bunch of stores and that was very good. But then in the end, instead of putting the money into the Berkeley stores and as Michael and other people suggested, just to, you know, deciding we could survive in Berkeley, she decided to open up that Marin store, which was a complete disaster. Oh. The location oh. was bad. And so that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And I remember being, you know, I was the co-editor at the time of uh, Mike was away of the co-op news. And I went to the co-op meeting where she presented the idea. And, uh, I had a big fight with Lynn because uh, I wrote about the meeting in a very biased way that it was a bad idea. And she uh, basically censured my report of the meeting. Uh, so she said, Marty, I'm the general manager and you're, you're not. And I think this is a great idea. And uh, I think that decision, if she had gone the other way and decided to make the Shattuck Co-op as a kind of gourmet boutique grocery store, it would have been a huge success. So I guess it's luck, who knows? Uh, but uh, anyway, that's my two cents. I had an interesting anecdote I could share. Can people hear me? Yes, go ahead. So this is Lee Tram pleasure. So in the mid to late 80s, I was working at Inner Sunset Community Food Store Workers Collective in San Francisco and I went to one of the co-op, I think El Cerrito was, had closed and there was an auction to get rid of stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, they've got all these computerized uh, cash registers. And I thought, you know, and I got them for like 50 bucks or something, right? And so we brought them back and stuck them in the garage at the store. And then, I don't know, six months or a year later, I got a, we never, we never got them connected. And the six months or a year later, I got a call from someone else at one of the other co-op stores saying, you know, we could really use some of those pieces of hardware because ours are wearing out. And we're like, we don't need them. So we just gave them back and, and they went back to work at, at another store in the co-op for the rest of uh, the rest of the co-op's time there. <laughs> Guess we could call that an example of cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, well, who else? Carol, go ahead. So um, my father um, was the manager of the Santa Monica Co-op in Southern California, and then um, decided to move up and worked for the Berkeley Co-ops for, for many years. Um, and he managed several of the, uh, the branches. And we lived in Walnut Creek at the time, and the, the Walnut Creek stores were actually very successful and really brought the community which was very conservative out there together so you know you sort of knew everybody who shopped at the uh, at the walnut creek stores and then i moved to berkeley in 1964 
And, um, you know, the co-ops were always such an important part of my life. And then um, Vanjie and I both sang on uh, the co-op Hootenanny um, <laughs> program that raised money. I think it was for the Berkeley. Um, uh, I will talk about that. Carol, Carol, I'm going to talk about that. Oh, I'm okay. Bring up, well, let me do that. Thank okay, you. you can talk about that then. <laughs> so, right. but uh, I feel like I grew up in the co-ops, do as a as a young child doing inventory in the Santa Monica co-op, and then being involved in the uh, the co-ops up here for for many many years. Okay, I'd like to start. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, this is Vanjie Buell, and I worked for the education department. And one of the things that we did, we did so many things in that education department, especially uh, uh, special uh, programs and activities for our uh, members. We did things like uh, food demonstrations, cultural shows, um, and one of the big thing, one of the big things we did was we organized the Berkeley Co-op Hoot Nanny, where we had. 3,000 people attended, and we had students from the co-op guitar classes, and here's the, here's the record. Oh. Here it is, the co-op hoot nanny. I have oh, it out yeah. here, too. Can you see it, folks? Yeah. Any yeah. rate, yeah. Show it. there it is, the co-op hoot nanny. We raised over $3,000 for, uh, for the uh, co-op uh, student co-ops in Berkeley as well as for co-op partners from around the world. Uh, and we had over, uh, like I said, over 3,000 people attended. We raised a lot of money. And we also did this record, and this raised a lot of money too. This raised about five to $6,000 for the co-op. And also we did the uh, special Black History Festival of which 20,000 people attended throughout all of our stores in the Bay Area a very successful program. And of course, yeah. I worked with the home economists on several programs too, uh, especially food programs. Wonderful. Yes. Angie, can you yes. tell me the date of the Hootenanny? Yes, it was 55 years ago, October 9th, 1969. Wow. 1965. Yeah, it was 65. 1965. In fact, one of the one of the performers called me uh, to uh, say we just celebrated 55 years of the of the co-op Hootenanny just this oh. October 9th. Wonderful. And you know who was who was featured in this? Betty Reed, who was the park uh, 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 <laughs> the regional park ranger for Rosie the Riveter, very famous. Oh. And she was just beautiful. And my yeah. students, uh, several of my students performed in this from the co-op uh, guitar classes. And Stanley Franks was one of the students in my class. Oh, and he oh. became a fabulous guitarist and he took Jerry Garcia's place of the Grateful Dead when Jerry Garcia died. These performers here became famous, including my daughter, Nikki Vilas and uh, oh, Dev Singh. Uh, they have performed all over the, the place. And I'm still performing, by the way. I uh, organize a, a hoot nanny here at Piedmont Gardens where I live. And I do a concert every other week with five other people. We play guitars, cajon drums, rhythm instruments, and 300 of our, of our uh, residents attend. It's a live performance and they attend in our courtyard. It's one, the only live performance that we could do here at Piedmont Gardens because of social distancing and wearing our mask. And people come out on the balconies as well as in the courtyard. So I'm still performing folks at age 88. Oh, that's great. That's great. Dave Angie. Oh, Carol. Carol was one of our, our beautiful singers in this uh, Hoot Nanny. It was just lovely, wasn't it, Carol? It, it, was, it was an incredible experience. And I've since learned that it's the first recording 
that anyone ever made of How Can I Keep From Singing, which oh, is a very yes. popular yes. folk song. Yes, and we and, sing that now. We still uh -oh. sing that. <laughs> the other thing I want to mention is that Lou Gottlieb of the oh. Limelighters was our master of ceremonies, and Dave Gard of the uh, Kingston Trio accompanied us on his guitar. Oh. So he accompanied several of our students. And you know, I was hired by the Limelighters to <laughs> sing, yes, in their group. But I didn't go because I, had to, I wanted to stay behind and take care of my children, my small, my small kids. But at any rate, it was an honor to be uh, hired by them. Any comments about the uh, expansion and retract and uh, failures of closing, losing enterprises, if anybody wants to hear. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, this is David, David Fleissig. I was on the board in the 1970s, which was a, a very uh, ferociously uh, controversial time, as Jane Lundeen could tell you. She and I served together for several years uh, on the board. My recollection oh. of expansion uh, efforts, uh, interestingly, is was not never driven by the union. In fact, I don't remember the union having anything to say about it whatsoever. It was largely ideological, a lot of pressure being brought to bear on the board uh, that uh, the co-op was not serving uh, underserved communities like downtown Oakland or certain areas in San Francisco. And that pressure led to some actual expansions, some uh, potential expansions that went quite a ways down the road uh, before they were voted on by the board. And in those days, in the 70s, uh, the board was typically five to four uh, and uh, would sometimes switch back and forth uh, every year uh, with an election. So as far as the union piece of it, the only thing I will say is that labor costs uh, at that time, and probably today too, are the single highest controllable cost of a supermarket, by far. And the co-op uh, union labor contract uh, meant that its cost structure ran about 1% higher than its competitors. May not sound like much, but at that point, the uh, typical profit margin of a supermarket, if it was good, was 1% or so. And so it was always a thin opportunity economic venture, or at least starting in the 70s and moving forward. As far as closing losing ventures, you run into the mirror image of the uh, uh, efforts to uh, force opening of new ones, which is pressure that uh, you can't do that. You can't take these services away from people in these communities. And so I don't want to oversimplify it, but it turned, it largely turned into a debate between those who uh, felt they were driven by the economic survival and success of the organization and those who felt that its philosophical obligation to serve uh, overcame that. So just a few words on the uh, turbulent 70s. Just, you know, uh, just, to mention, just to mention, Greg Patmore's book really does cover the kind of thing you're talking about in, in great and sometimes almost tragic detail. Um, but if you want, if you want to, if you want an insight into some of those kinds of arguments that the book certainly deals with that. Does Greg Patmore recite the, uh, incident of the uh, killing in the Telegraph Avenue co-op? Um, I think I just try to remember, I, I'm aware of it and the incident, I think it's in the book uh, about about uh, somebody being shot. Yes, I do remember. I've got a lot in the book. <laughs> it might be only very brief, but it's there, I think. About the issue of policing, it raised a whole lot of questions mm -hmm. about policing in Berkeley. Yeah, and police methods, which I think is quite interesting thinking about the current debates about uh, defunding police in the United States. There was a similar sort of discussion in uh, Berkeley in the 70s. And I think that incident was part of that. I just, 
have to re go back and check my book. There's a lot in there. <laughs> what happened in that event? I'm not aware of it. Well, I'll, I'll tell you briefly. And uh, uh, what happened is a armed robber came into the Telegraph Avenue yes. store, uh, went into the uh, uh, treasurer's office, the little cat where the safe was. Uh, there was an employee in there, pistol whipped him to try to get him to open the safe. Uh, the poor guy was panicked uh, and managed to hit a silent alarm, uh, but did get the safe open. Uh, it turned out there was a Berkeley policeman not too far away who responded to the silent alarm. Store was open, by the way. There were customers in there. Uh, came in, uh, and the armed robber came out of the little office, which, as you recall, was on the left side of the entrance doors, down a blind alley. That's how you got into the little cashier's office. And he turned the wrong way. He made a left turn away from the store and instead of right turn into the store, realized he was in a blind alley, turned back, fired two or three shots into the store. Mm. Unfortunately, didn't hit him. Oh. Uh, at which point the Berkeley policeman fired back, hit him and killed him. That's oh. what happened. There was a board meeting in the Telegraph Avenue co-op, uh, <laughs> ironically, uh, that occurred within, I'd say, a week of this incident. And uh, at the board, uh, who shows up? But well, Tom Hayden heading a group called the, I think it was called the Red Family, something like that. And uh, just in complete outrage of this killing. And just to illustrate the, uh, the uh, internecine board relations at this time, a motion was made at that board meeting that to avoid anything like that happening in the future, that if there were an armed robbery of, of a co-op store, that the employees were directed not to call the police until the robbers had successfully left the store. At which point I remember saying myself that if you enact this motion, uh, you might as well take all the proceeds from the day and pile them up on the sidewalk uh, and just leave them. That motion, by the way, failed by one vote. It was five to four against adopting that motion. So that tells you in a sort of a, you know, a nutshell, sort of the political context of what was going on at the time. If I can just mention on page 189, I do talk about it. It's actually in there. The flat uh, deputation from the flat Flatlands Neighbourhood Committee to the Board of Directors. So I've got it in there about the shooting. It's on page 189 if you want to have a look. <laughs> so I, I just couldn't read really, so much in that book. I just can't remember everything. <laughs> what, year did, what year did that happen? Oh, dear, I'll have to go back and check now. Uh, I had it there. I just had the book open, but it's uh, in the 70s, early 70s. Jane, 70s. were you still on the board at that time? I don't think so, but I'm trying to remember. Well, I think you'd remember this one. Um, yeah. Somebody, there was a there was a shooting when Bob Arnold was campaigning for oh. the second time I was elected, but it didn't end up in anybody dying. Oh, yeah. It was well, January, it was uh, nineteen seventy one. Uh, there was a fatal shooting in January nineteen seventy one of a robber <laughs> in the Telegraph Avenue Center. Hmm. Yeah. No, I don't think I was on the board yet. Yeah, nineteen seventy one. Because I do big, remember. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. There's a question in the chat. Are there pictures anywhere that document the warehouse located near Point Isabel, where Costco is currently located? Is, was there a co-op warehouse there? It was the original building that is Costco took over that building. They've since torn it down and built a new one. Um, you're saying I used to know my way around it. It was very um sort of split personality to go in there and not have it to co-op. It was associated cooperatives. The yes, I know. I know. Yeah. That Bob Neptune was in charge of. And then when uh, we did, you know, some downsizing, the main offices of the Berkeley co-op then joined in that uh, venture out there. And then that's where we were there in the beginning 80s, I think it was. Yeah, I worked out too. 
Associated Cooperatives and 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 Consumers Co-op, Berkeley Co-op. Right. That was headquarters. Right. And, so and eventually, I think Greg Greg's book points out eventually there was that break. There was a break in the eighties between the, between Associated Cooperatives and the Berkeley Co-op. So yes. at the very end, that that warehouse was not being used by Berkeley anymore. Right. Correct. If if I could just having gone say, through. Yeah. If I could just add something, um, what I think is very important about both the oral histories and all the research that's being done is that it's important to reflect very strongly on the um, the initiatives. And the one that I I really find lingers in people's memory is the kitty corrals, <laughs> the kitty corrals particularly. And what I thought you might be interesting is a story uh, that happened last year here in Australia. I was at the State Federation of Cooperatives, our Cooperative Federation of New South Wales meeting. And a guy gets up from a very successful cooperative called the Hastings Co-op, which is about 250 miles north of Sydney, where I am at the moment. And he said, oh, we're going to introduce this idea of providing childminding to kids when their parents go into the supermarket. And I said, have you ever heard of a kiddie corral? And the next minute I know I'm up for third, well, 10 minutes telling the Federation about the concept of Berkeley's kitty corrals. Anyway, <laughs> this guy independently had thought about it, but they're all starting to say, yeah, it's a great idea. So all I'm saying to you is the memories, the ideas are important to talk about. And they do impact upon current cooperative practice. That's what the incredible story of Berkeley I find very exciting and very inspirational is about. But anyway, I just thought I'd say that. Can I interject? Uh, I am a Kitty Corral alumnus. Oh. Um, I, I grew up in Berkeley and uh, a lot of interesting things about the co-op. The co-op, uh, I mean, the Kitty Corral was uh, an integrated space before uh, Berkeley schools are integrated actually. And um, yes, you know, that's I, a really interesting thing. And it also, I think, you know, the, the co-op, if it did nothing else, it raised consciousness in this community and beyond. And I think that's something to be celebrated and not mourned. Um, and also, I think uh, I have other connections to the co-op. Um, Bob Shildren edited an, an article of mine one time for the co-op news. Uh, Bob is Mike Gray. Um, I wrote about <laughs> dental floss for, for Bob. <laughs> and uh, it was a very fabulous article. I'm sure it's Exciting. archived yeah. somewhere. Yes. Um, and explain the marketing behind dental floss. Um, <laughs> And it's a small town. Berkeley was a small town, maybe still is a small town. And a lot of these people here, I, I sort of recognize. Lee Tramplesher grew up across the street from me on Sacramento Street. Um, Lee, your brother Cal and you and your dad was my postman. Um, and co-op was a place, you know, my mom and dad were not uh, big activists or, or anything, but, but uh, you know, they shopped there because <laughs> the prices were right and it was close by. It was, a, it was a gathering place. And I, I think it's something that we should all uh, treasure, even if it uh, you know, was only a, ephemeral for 50 years. I think it's, it was a great place. And, um, and What's your uh, name? What's your name? My name is Michael Gray. What's your, Michael Gray. And, Michael Gray. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm M. Gray 02 on your screen there. Um, but uh, I grew up here and I, lots of brothers and sisters and people still around. And, I was going to ask, Gray Brecken is on his call too. I know Gray. Great. Um, I'm interested in the buildings. Were those buildings built for the co-op? Because they're still around. And, you know, one is a tar Target or something. And one is uh, Whole Foods. And one is uh, uh, Safeway Andronico's now. Uh, did, did, yeah. did, did the co-op build those buildings? Yeah. The Shad Co-op was built as, as a co-op. El Cerrito was built as a co-op. Well, it's been torn yeah. down and replaced. It isn't there anymore. University. But the 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 Telegraph Avenue store was a Sid's market that uh, right. that uh, yeah. bought. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I defer to others about that. Oh, Harvey, do you know? No, I uh, the Angie just uh, answered the question. Oh. Yeah, they. There were some that were built and some that were purchased. Um, uh, yes. Of the Berkeley stores, the University Avenue and the Shattuck were built by the co-op. Yeah. And, yes. and the Telegraph Avenue oh. store was, was a city mm -hmm. store. Yeah. And the hardware store. 
Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those we're, were we're, units that they and sort the of gas put station. I, I think they station. built Geary Road, the first of the Walnut Creek stores. Yeah. Right. Um, the second was part of one of the expansions. One of the bat, yeah, the expansions, the market basket. Mm -hmm. We, we've got a, a couple of questions uh, in the chat, and uh, I'll, I'll read, I'll start with one. Uh, for, for one, uh, David mentioned this very small profit margin uh, in the grocery business, and that was one of the things when I worked at the co-op that I learned and, and kind of amazed me. And so the question is, how much did the rise of for-profit groceries that sold organic food products in Berkeley play in the role of the co-op demise? Oh, so the, com the competition aspect, because as we know that the co-op did very many innovative things that were adapted by other, you know, for-profit stores. Right, right. Yeah, my my feeling is the Berkeley yeah. Bowl, all that was part of it, uh, was an, a very I, small I, element. I don't think that. Yeah, a very small element of it. Uh, but the, it was certainly they were borrowing some of the ideas and uh, that was a competitive issue. Right. Lucky and Safeway have unit pricing now. Yeah. The, the co-op did not live in vain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to the point I made before about the legacy, how it influences, still continues to influence. Correct. Uh, we've got another question. Uh, why do co-ops uh, tend to flourish most successfully in university communities? And I guess we'd have to ask, is, is that from our scholars, is, is that uh, true? Uh, they do tend to flourish in a wide range of places if you look internationally. Um, in Australia, for example, we have a lot of them flourish in small rural communities. Right. Uh, and you've got right. examples of that in California too. I think isn't Grass Valley? I'm not what? sure of Grass Valley, but right. some of those areas outside urban, outside university towns, they do actually work, and they've survived. And the way they've survived in Australia is be not because they don't have a cooperative wholesaler. What we have is a com a hybrid of franchising and cooperatives and. You're probably familiar in the US because there is an American uh, group called IGA. IGA mm -hmm. was a group of stores. And what's happened in Australia is many of our surviving co-ops have linked up with IGA. And I noticed in the US, there were some examples of that too, but not they don't have to necessarily be in university towns. Right. And, and well, I, I think that I, I, I think that that may be partially true with consumer co-ops, but there's a whole other range of co-ops I yeah, think that are not necessarily tied to university towns at all. Right. Yeah. Well, I know that during the um, late '40s, '50s, because my parents were part of it, there was a move to go down the San Joaquin Valley, and they would be like buying clubs oh. uh, in these farm areas and everything like that where they didn't have grocery stores necessarily and so they'd be groups of people and families and things like that that would be buying and then they beca they became co-ops and um yeah. went that direction but yeah that was something in terms of the education and flourishing of co-ops that was one of the things that was going on at that time you yeah, well one of the things that's interesting is that co-ops can also be transformational i think the santa monica one ended up turning into a credit union and I think that a lot of our dairy co-ops transform themselves into consumer co-ops it's a right. form of shift it's quite interesting um, and a lot of the agricultural co-ops <laughs> set up stores and began mm -hmm. to sell, sell so they became hybrids in some ways mm -hmm. right and uh, yeah so it's it's quite a I, I enjoy looking at this area because it's side, quite transformational they shift they take various forms and they can survive and it's quite amazing it's that, still that, worth yeah. noting though that in, in the u.s at least the most successful were centered in university communities yeah uh, notably berkeley and hyde park and yeah. then now 
even the biggest ones that I know of now that are still operating are Davis and Arcata and Puget uh, uh, up, in, yeah. up in Washington, yes. And actually the last manager uh, at the Berkeley Co-op, Jeff Volz, went up there to become the manager in Puget. And I believe he worked there a long time. I don't really know for sure. But again, that is also a, a university uh, town. If you, if you are, oh, sorry. Oh. Berkeley's rival for the biggest was the one in Washington, D.C. And I don't think of that as primarily a union. That's correct. The Greenbelt. Yeah. The Greenbelt right. one. I mean, it was Greenbelt versus us. Yeah. Um, right. Patronage versus members. It's it's I actually you measured it. Yeah, it's actually a very interesting parallel story. There's actually a history of the Greenbelt one that it, in some ways parallels. And Berkeley and Greenbelt were swapping ideas. Um, so it's, you're right, it's a good example of a, a non-acid, non-university town one. Another one that's interesting is Ithaca. Um, Ithaca has had a, a history of uh, a co-op like Berkeley uh, it went under, but it had a breakaway, and now it's reformed as part of the new generation uh, cooperatives, part of the National Growth Institute. It's still there, but it went through a period, you know, of, of conflict, demise, then resurfaced. But it's in a university town. But Greenbelt is a good example. I was part of the. I want to point out that, and I'm sure a Gray would underscore this: that Greenbelt is uh, an entirely built, a New Deal built town. Yep. And uh, so it, the, the center of the town <clears throat> has the co-op, it has the credit union, it, it's, uh, it's very interesting. That's the community. New York Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think part of the answer is that a, a, a co-op is a utopian ideal. And I think people who understand that uh, uh, respond to it. And I think it takes a certain amount of uh, um, you know, commitment and community uh, involvement and, and, and even a little intellectual, uh, uh, you know, interest in, in that idea to make this thing successful. Um, apologies to all the people that tried to run the place over the years, but I think um, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of what I think the buy-in is, is that people respond to this as a, this is an ideal and I want to be part of this. Well, that, let, me, let me follow up on that. Um, maybe Greg could answer this. I, my assumption is that the co-op is a small percentage of the overall U.S. economy. You know, if you look at all the co-ops, producer, consumer, worker. Uh, but I'm wondering if there are other countries where the uh, cooperative uh, aspect of the economy is at a much higher level uh, than we have here. Well, certainly, uh, into, if you look at different sectors, uh, Italy is an example of a very strong um, cooperative uh, consumer se section. If you look at it, but the United States, for example, does have particularly strong credit union movement and also its agricultural uh, cooperatives are very strong, particularly in the Midwest. Um, if you look at Sweden, the Nordic countries, very strong um, consumer cooperative movements as well. So there are countries and, it, you know, uh, some countries, Singapore is an example of a country that has a very strong consumer cooperative movement, uh, mm -hmm. very influential, as well as credit union movement. Uh, there's a number of countries you can draw upon. Uh, my, my country <laughs> it has its strengths, certainly in agriculture. Uh, one of our biggest exporters, uh, a wheat uh, co a growers cooperative is an example. But there are examples of countries where they're very dominant in retail. You know, um, uh, Upton Sinclair um, published a book, a, a novel in 1936 called Co op, which is probably an outcome of his run for governor in 34. Yeah. I wonder if anybody knows about that novel and whether it could have had an influence on Berkeley or the co op movement in general. Well, there, there was a pretty strong Upton Sinclair. Yeah. club in Berkeley during the election and a lot of those people I think went on to become part of the original co-op I think I okay. think Greg you mentioned that oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah there's actually Up Upton Sinclair had a big impact on the Californian political climate and culture in regard to generally I don't know specifically about that book but certainly there's no denying that uh, his epic the epic program had a big influence 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're about at our time limit here. Uh, so at this point, I, I want to thank all the presenters. I think it's been a very rich discussion. Um, and I, I hope it uh, encourages you to, to get the Bob Marsh book, uh, to get the last two copies of, of Greg's book, and, and consider your research on, on co-ops. I noticed Barbara Marsh uh, Bogue's hand going up. So I, I just want to give her maybe the last opportunity to, to say yeah. something. OK? Oh, a, thank you. It's unusual for me. I'm usually the first one jumping in, but it was fascinating <laughs> to listen to. Um, I think that in terms of the two books, our book is extremely complementary because it's the inside out. And uh, I wanted to be sure to honor those people in the Berkeley Historical Society who started this project, starting with Therese for sure. She, was, she did the interview and I learned more from Therese and going through the process of the evolution of this book than, um, than any child would coming from my <laughs> point of view. So um, uh, it was a great education for me. And I thank you all, uh, particularly you, Therese, who spurred oh. the project and started it from ground zero. So uh, oh. I appreciate everybody. Uh, Holly, I remember you. And I remember you too. <laughs> and, and yes, and uh, uh, Carol Pearson, um, of course, my dad worked with your dad uh, during the Berkeley co-op years in, at uh, Walnut Creek. I'm still in Walnut Creek, and uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, you're right, and those comments that were made about the expansion and bringing Walnut Creek into a fold that Berkeley had established long before was really important. So. Uh, I appreciate the time and, and all the things that went into both this introducing the book for us. And uh, I think you'll find it entertaining if you decide you want to read it. It's uh, Greg, I appreciate your um, expertise on the subject. I started out as uneducated, so I very much appreciate it. And I have your book. So oh, well, thank you. <laughs> So thank you for that, for all of that. And thank you all for uh, presenting here today. I thoroughly enjoyed listening. Thank you. And it looks like that the event is being recorded. So perhaps it will be available through the historical system. Yes, I will um, do a little and, and put it up on YouTube. And um, so you can go to our website, berkeleyhistoricalsociety.org and that will have a, a link to that and also um, reiterate how you can buy a copy of either book. Um, John, how much are we asking for Greg's book? 114. 114, 114 is what we're selling it for. <laughs> and um, as far as putting the other book in bookstores, um, uh, we sure wouldn't make much money that way because you know it costs us uh, about ten dollars a copy to uh, to have them printed, and then they would want a fifty percent discount probably. The oh the the oral history transcripts. There's several that are now. Oh, Linda <laughs> finally made it. There are several who that are um, um, on our accessible through our website now. The the most recent transcript, oh, really? including the Oiva Normalo one. And the old ones were um, not done digitally, I don't think. So we have hard copies at the History Center and you could uh, make appointments to come in and see, see them or even to, uh, you can buy a copy, have a copy, um, you know, photocopied and buy it all through um, John Aronovici, our manager. Um, oh yeah, and then I just want to encourage people to take a look at our Facebook group if you're, if you're in Facebook at all. It's called Ber uh, Berkeley History, and it's very participatory. People are putting up uh, photos that they have, and um, you know, commenting on each other's uh, things and, and pictures that we put up, and um, it's it's kind of fun. Linda Rose, yeah. want to add anything? You sort of tuned in late. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Linda, 
Yeah, and, well, I was very frustrated with the event bright not letting me in. Yeah. But thank you for the link, Anne. <laughs> um, well, it definitely was a noble venture, the co-op. Yeah. Um, definitely. Uh, and uh, the, I, I, I missed most of what you said, but the, the co-op home economist completely pioneered. You'll be able um, to watch the video and um, we, uh, yeah. I also want to thank all the speakers. I also want to thank Barbara Book. She's done a tremendous amount of work on this oh, yeah. uh, Bob March oral history book. And, and is it, we're is still it working on that. Can you just say something, Anne? Can I just say that uh, I also, I meant to say it earlier when Barbara was around, I hope she can hear this, that uh, I, I really appreciated a lot of the work she did on the family history, because I don't think the book would have been as colorful without that ingredient. And she did a good job. And it has lots of pictures uh, uh, put together mm -hmm. by Barbara and by Therese and other people. And, um, <clears throat> oh, yes, and I, I wanted to, it, it, it's especially great that we could have Greg Patmore with us by doing this on Zoom. If we'd done this. In oh, definitely. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Well, I can't yeah. leave Australia at the moment. We've got a travel ban until we've got the boat. So <laughs> it's nice to come virtually anyway. So you're doing it this way. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Many of you remember this guy. <laughs> yeah. I want to say, yeah, thank you to, to Greg for doing the oh. initial transcription of the four um, new co-op oral histories, which are now available on our website of Carol, Melbourne, Ava Goodwin, Oiva Nirmala. So he, he uh, had them transcribed initially and then we, we worked on them and they are now all available. You can read them under our oral history a section of our website, so thank you. And Janine's okay. daughter Paloma did a lot of work on them too, <laughs> editing yeah. and such. Absolutely. Well, it was sort of strange when you had an Australian transcriber, but anyway, we got there. <laughs> <laughs> so was I. <laughs> yeah, it took some doing getting some of the names right and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay, thank you all for coming and um, oh, and hey, thank I, you. Let me put in one more plug. We were getting ready to put up an online exhibit about the uh, history of food in Berkeley in general. <laughs> um, Berkeley's fascination, <laughs> which will include uh, a lot of stuff about the gourmet ghetto and all kinds of other things. So um, uh, you can get on our email list by sending an, a message. You can also send me follow-up messages to email at Berkeley Historical Society Org. Okay. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.